Hello and welcome to Season 7, Episode 5 of the Ubuntu Podcast. It's Wednesday the 30th of April and we're going to discuss what's been happening in the news and in the Ubuntu community. If you're listening live, you can send us messages using the chat thing on the website <laughs> and in the hash UPC IRC channel. I'm Laura and joining me this week are Mark. Hello. Alan. Hello. And Tony. Good evening. How are you all? Great. Yep, good. Excellent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> These two have had a bit of a tiff. No, we haven't. <laughs> Which two? Oh, sorry, not you. Oh, We're okay. not talking about it. <laughs> Alan and Mark, they're, oh dear. they're sitting next to each other, staring straight ahead. Yeah, well, they, they normally do. Alan doesn't like people to look at him when he's podcasting. <laughs> That's why we're not doing the webcam thing. Yeah. No, no eye contact. Yes. Look away. Yes. That's the way I prefer to do it anyway. Yes. No. Yeah. Shall we, um, you know... It's fine. Do some news? Yes, why not? Sounds like a stress-packed show. <laughs> And now it's time for the news. And well, after the, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, after the departure of Vic Gontora, Gondotra. Do, Gond, Gondotra from Google, many news organisations have been spelling the end for Google Plus, the social network he was the lead of. Oh. That was the guy you told me to message, wasn't it? Yes, it was. That'd yes. be why he didn't reply. Well, he only yeah. he only left last week. But you're so. probably thinking about it. Yeah, he, it was. That was probably what tipped him tipped over him the edge. <laughs> yeah. He was like, "Oh God, this blooming Laura woman, get off my back!" So this this <laughs> was this guy basically Google Plus was his his baby. Yes. Yeah. Right. He headed up the division and and uh, he left kind of rapidly he posted um about uh, some family issues that kind of triggered him thinking about uh, moving on and what's next in your life and uh, you know new stories and uh, you know new adventures and and so on and then left some reports um, say he might have been fired yeah i've seen you know as always there are people who are saying he was a great person to work with and others saying he wasn't so much and interestingly the um in the uh, Silicon Valley area. There's a there's a um, an app called Secret that uh, actually someone mentioned that he was interviewing um, some days before he actually left the company. So it, it had leaked out, but whether people were aware of it or not, um, mm. yeah. So, so all it, the news articles from all the tech press who never use Google Plus <laughs> are all telling everyone that Google Plus is dead. Most notably. Places like TechCrunch. And, yeah. Uh, well, there was there was there was a story saying that Google were going to have to stop forcing uh, all of their other services to integrate with Google Plus because this guy was leaving. Um, right. I I just I don't see where most yeah all of their stuff did seem just to be sort of. Well, it does seem like they've reallocated resources around other parts of the company, like taking right. and and it's a significant number of people that they have working on Google Plus. Yeah. It's yeah. like. A few thousand people working on this social platform that you know have been thrown to different parts of the company, like mobile and uh, and other parts. Well, I thought I thought it recently actually. It just kind of started looking up and being yeah. a bit more active. Yeah, I mean, it, obviously, like any social network, different people you know like different ones. Some people love Facebook, some people love Twitter, and others loved Identica <laughs> so, for some reason. Status dot net. <laughs> yeah, and Pump dot io or whatever. <laughs> But Pumpio. But you know, Google Plus seems to have been the one that that a lot of the tech press have have constantly vilified and said is is dead or is dying or is a ghost town. And and then you get people who are really popular and people who have a lot of followers on Google Plus then respond with, "Well, surely it's not, given I have this many <laughs> hundreds of thousands of people following my posts and I get this much engagement or interaction on my posts." And so yeah, it's um. It's still wait and see. But, um, yeah. yeah. That takes more people to build something than it does to maintain it as well. So Yeah, and it's very easy to write an article saying how rubbish it is and it's all going to fall apart. And, uh, is it? Oh, well, yeah. I might, yeah. Might give it a go. Well, everyone's, <laughs> everyone's doing it, Tony. Yeah. You really should. You should all the rage, it. darling. Yes, exactly. Moving on. Mm. Uh, the Linux Foundation have announced the Core in Infrastructure Initiative, a scheme to provide funding to open source projects that provide key industry standard components. Things like, oh, I don't know, SSL. Ooh. Uh, companies backing the initiative include Amazon, Google, IBM, Qualcomm, Facebook, Microsoft, 
and all the big players you'd expect. The all first, every single one of them. Every single <laughs> one of the big players you expect. Uh, the first project. All the cool kids. Yes, yeah. will be uh, funding is part. Uh, the first project that will receive funding is OpenSSL. Yeah. Fancy that. Yes. So is this called the Stable Door Project? Is Just a bit. It, right. Okay. <laughs> yes. Well, it's, you know, it's it's interesting that they all come running at the point when they realise that this key bit of infrastructure that they absolutely all depend on for, you know, something as important as, oh, I don't know, security. But, mm. uh, yeah, my project didn't need to worry about it. <laughs> Why, is everything insecure in your project? Then? No, oh. secure, no hot lead. <laughs> Or a, a proprietary SSL implementation? I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> no, just, just a really good one. You just believed the announcement that says yeah. we're not. I made the announcement. <laughs> oh, okay. It's all about the little padlock. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a little padlock, it's secure. Yeah. That's the way it goes. I mean, it's obviously good to see and, you know, that, that uh, some of these core cool bits of infrastructure are going to get funding from yeah. big companies that use those those projects. And that's always been the... A moral but not legal um, argument around companies supporting the stuff that they use a lot. It's it's still supposedly cheaper for them to stick a couple of engineers on OpenSSL or Samba or whatever technology they use, Apache, MySQL, you name it, um, and then it is to license huge proprietary equivalents from uh, closed-source software vendors that they then can't tinker with. I hmm. wonder if uh, uh, there are any uh, uh, conspiracy theorists wondering if... Uh, Someone yes, at the Linux yes, Foundation are. planted this problem in uh, in OpenSSL just so they could get funding two years later from all of these immense companies that have truckloads of money to throw at this. Well, it is the internet, so yes, there will yes. be somebody somewhere thinking exactly that. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know why that came to me, but there you go. Yeah. So, <laughs> turning overseas now to the US, where a magistrate has ruled that companies issued with warrants for customer data must produce that data, even if it's stored on a server outside the USA. The ruling comes in response to Microsoft, uh, a Microsoft challenge against a warrant to turn over data held in its Dublin data centre. Uh, Microsoft had previously offered customers a choice as to where their data was held, with the implication that data held outside the US was safe from US authorities. Yes. This is quite uh, an interesting and wide-ranging case. Um, it should be noted that Microsoft are appealing this judgment, yeah. which has basically been made at a fairly low level in the US judiciary system, um, and I think quite a lot of commentators expect it to be... Um, overturned or counter a countermanded or whatever when it gets slightly higher up the chain surely, but, surely they'll just move the ownership of of core bits of infrastructure to another part of the company they'll like have a subsidiary that's like owned by some other part of the company that's that's based in Liechtenstein or somewhere you know that, exactly and it starts to get very complicated when you're into a company the size of microsoft anyway which already has eu um subsidiary companies and mm, things so right. at, at what point can one company order another company to do something I don't know. Um, the judge's argument was that it would it wasn't actually US authorities um, getting the data. It was like a subpoena, which meant that Microsoft had to hand over the data. So it was Microsoft getting the data from its own data center and then handing that over to the US authorities. So no US uh, agents, uh, would, <laughs> no US agents would go to the data center and do oh, anything. Oh, that's okay then, right? With a big USB stick. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, and, and an airplane ticket in their back pocket. Um, but yeah. So generally, the, the uh, conception is that stuff within the EU. Well, the U uh, European. Uh, data protection laws mean that anything within the EU is uh, subject to those rules mm. and can't be shared without consent and all that sort of thing. So it implies that anything outside the EU can't inherently have access to data without permission from the users. So you would need to get the user's permission in order to give the data, for example, to the US government, which is why people have data centres in Europe and have data centres in Russia and right. places like that where uh, a US agent can't just walk into it because anything inside the US they can. They can go into data center, or, you know, flash their badge, put on their shades, and uh, just like the movies, kick the door down. Um, yeah, <laughs> kick the door down, rip the server out of the rack, yeah, and, and walk off with it under their arm, yeah, mm. and make a quip as they do. <laughs> <laughs> that Tony hadn't thought of for that bit. Yeah, <laughs> Laura. Some more data news. Uh, Google's announced that Google Apps for Education, the free service for educational institutions, will no longer be used for advertising. Um, so apps for education accounts will no longer have Google adverts displayed by default. I think I thought that they, <laughs> it was actually being removed. I thought they, you weren't going to be able to turn it back on either. I think I saw the word default in oh, the okay, article, then. but I might, it might have been relating to something else. Um, so, yeah, so emails and documents no longer 
have data harvested for advertising. And apparently if you log in with a K-12, which is an American education thing, account yes. to Google search, it won't advertise to you then either. Oh, right. That's interesting. Mm. Does it have safe search on as well? We I always have safe so, search yeah. on by default. Oh, right. Okay. Oh. I don't know. Not, Not on Tony's computers. <laughs> 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 I've never had reason to turn it off. I don't know. Yeah. Right. But, Officer. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of interesting seeing these two stories together because some because you know one of the well certainly I'll be working in the education sector. There's a lot of sort of concern over people using cloud services like this and data protection around students' data if the um, if someone's going to be harvesting data from students' work and emails. Is that going to be safe? Is that going to be under data protection? So now uh, it comes out that actually it might be at risk from. USA government agencies and suddenly Google mm. say, oh, actually, we're not going to do that for you anymore then. Yeah, interesting. But mm. then I suppose they could still just get the data which is on the servers, so it's not that much of a, a protection if uh, if this ruling is upheld. Mm. Well, there we go. I hope it won't be. Oh, and it's me. Yep. <laughs> uh, well, that's why we're all Tony looking at you. Tony was filling badly. <laughs> yes. Uh, developer Antimatter 15 has released Project Naptha, a browser extension uh, that uses text recognition to allow selection, copying, editing, and translation in images on the web. This is awesome. It's the best thing I've seen so today. So if you've got, if you've got a bitmap image, um, I don't necessarily mean a .bmt, I mean a non-vector image, so a JPEG, a PNG, or a GIF on the web. Like a log cap on the web. A picture, <laughs> a a picture on the web a picture, a a picture on the web <laughs> with some text on it. Then this lets you select that text like it was just normal text. Yeah, like it was an overlaid piece of text in a in yes. a document. And then you can editing. you can edit it or you can delete it and it'll fill in the background. As long as you, you can, squint a little bit. You can like shove it through a translation service and it'll overlay the translation on the image. Um, it really is awesome. It, yeah, or you can copy it, <laughs> copy it and paste it into a text document. And call why for on, accessibility. Why on earth would you need to be able to do this? It sounds cool, but who cares, honestly? Okay, well, yeah. <laughs> if you if some idiot has posted a thing on Facebook, which is a load of uh, instead of actually posting a post, is a, an image of some text. It's usually not worth reading. It's usually not worth reading. Yes, but if you don't know, if you can't see it, then you don't know that. Whereas this could. Uh, recognize the text That's and read true. it out to you if so you couldn't see it if you can't see it you could be missing out on all kinds of homilies <laughs> mm. i like those pictures that are photos with some words over the top of them memes. by a famous person memes no like, like a, a quote oh i okay. see a lot of those on facebook oh from your friends and family who are yeah. Well, yeah. Not specific, who are? Not specific. <laughs> who are, you know, wanting to share their or nuggets of wisdom that were shared with them. Yeah. Not, not specific with say, my family. Say, say um, uh, you, you'd just taken some photos which were being featured on a CD cover and uh, you wanted to t- copy the title of that CD cover uh, just so that you had the, the title verbatim and you hadn't made any mistakes, then you could just copy and paste it off that image if you were, for instance, posting it on your blog. I think it's, yeah. it's one of those things That's where once you have it enabled... You can see how you would use it because, you yeah. know, it, like under normal circumstances, when you're browsing the web and there's a picture that's got a piece of text on it, you know, you can't select that. If someone said to me, like, if I'm looking at a, an image, um, which is like a, a promotional poster of, um, I don't know, an invitation to a, a party or something, and it's got the location, the postcode and all that kind of stuff in okay. to, to where it is, mm. I could just select the postcode off the poster rather than type it in and save valuable time. Yeah. But yeah. I think it's one of those things that you know that if you've got a document open, you could just highlight any piece of text and just copy and paste it somewhere. Whereas an image, you mentally know you can't just grab a chunk of text off it. But with this enabled, it kind of makes you think, but oh, I, I could. I bet yeah. your children's children won't have that mental block. Yeah. They'll just go, it's, it's text, it's an image, whatever. Yeah. It's just bits. It's just yeah, this. Man. It's just so nice, man. the one I think the one thing I want to try it on is I've got this. Um, I requested a German journal article from the library, and because it's from the eighties, it's really it's just a scan of like an image scan. Mm. It's not got any OCR or anything. And I don't speak German, so I'm going to have to translate it. So I was going to translate it through Google Translate after doing the OCR, and so I might just try it with this and see Copy what happens. And paste. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Um, so currently the extension is only available for Chrome and Chromium, um, but support for other browsers is planned. The guy said if you go to projectnaptha.com, 
there is a, a box to put your email address in. He says if he gets lots of people signing up, then he'll uh, look at doing a Firefox version of it soon. Does it all work locally, or does it send the image off to the cloud and and do the deep, the the analysis in the cloud or something? I don't client know. Side, I think it's I, all client I side. Guess it's yeah. Client side, yeah. That's pretty amazing. So I think I only skimmed it, but I think what's on the website isn't the full power of it because we obviously don't have the plugin installed. So he's just mimicking it on the way you can practice with it well right. and we've talked for so long we don't have much time now for our gaming news oh, yeah. that's oh a shame, Tony. come on tony but very quickly i'm sure you'll tell us be... as much as you know I, I'll, quickly. I'll try and squeeze it all in so okay. don't don't interrupt me again or whatever <laughs> yeah. i um, won't right okay you. i know that you could talk for minutes about this stuff Seconds yeah even. Uh, tell us tony you, you realize you're wasting your own valuable time here not Go mine on, yes got dad a right. minute Okay, so Unity 3D have demonstrated the new WebGL export feature of the upcoming version 5 of their popular game development tool. What does that mean? Um, it means that you can uh, export to WebGL um, in the new version of, of the, the software that they're going to be releasing at some point in the future. Okay, mm. and what um, does that allow you to do? Uh, export to WebGL. Uh, I think I said that yeah, already. So what would, what's the advantage? Mark? Sorry, what, so what, uh, I'm just, I'm oh. just curious what the advantage of being able to export uh, a Unity it game sounds to WebGL exciting. is. It, it sounds, sounds very Web20. Well, if you, <laughs> if you hadn't talked for so long earlier, you would be able to find out oh, more about it. Oh, have out of time. Almost, no, no, no. but there's just time to tell you quickly that the demo features Dead Trigger 2, which was um, oh. the uh, snuff version of Only <laughs> Fools and Horses. Um, <laughs> Too soon, too, too soon. Su- too soon, army. Um, running in a modern, uh, runs in a modern browser with no plugins required. So basically, you can play games on the web. Awesome. I've, I played Chucky Egg on the web years oh. ago. <laughs> it, it doesn't mention Chucky Egg in the article I read. I mean, that I intrinsically know. I, I played. I tried playing this on my desktop, and it works surprisingly well. And it's just so this is three D accelerated. Games yeah, I mean, the there's like billions of layers between my web browser and the 3D card right down the bottom of the stack. You know, it, it feels like it shouldn't it, it shouldn't be that fast. That there's so much in between that you know, natively compiling a game for you know assembly language that, that machine code that runs on the CPU and and calls that go to the 3D card that should be super fast. Having like a whole desktop and a and a, a browser and, and, and all this JavaScript. other stuff and JavaScript in between just feels like it shouldn't be fast, but it's pretty amazing. It wow. uses M, M scriptum, which allows you to compile uh, applications into JavaScript. It's really amazing. Yeah. So uh, 3D accelerated sorry, JavaScript. Sorry, Tony, I didn't mean to steal. Sorry, Tony. Well, oh, sorry. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you sorry. just stole his thunder there. See, now I'm annoyed with you as well. Oh, God. Yeah, I'm not going to look at you anymore either. You're going to be... The Ubuntu podcast needs you. Yes, you. If you hear something that tickles, titillates, or taunts you, tweet us at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook, and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. We really would like to hear from you. So go on, do your duty, keep calm, and compose an email. I suppose you want me to do the community news now, don't you? No. Nope. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm going to do it anyway. Um, Fine. So in uh, the previous episode, we talked about 1404 and what an amazing release with no bias that was. Um, Secure, is it? And, uh, Whatever. Yeah, there have been a few um, interesting bugs that have uh, turned up. <laughs> Such there's, as? Well, there's one that, um, that there was a lot of hand-wringing in the community that, oh, gosh, how did this happen? Which was if you um, lock the screen and then hold the enter key down, uh, you can explode Unity to a point where you can get to the desktop again. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, without typing the password that. in. That's what, a bit sorry. of a flaw. But it turns out that was fixed before the release. Oh, it was found the day before the release and <laughs> fixed, like, pretty promptly. Um, so it was kind of, you know, panic over. That's not a problem. But that was something that was reported a- allegedly a long time ago. No, not that one. Not, I don't think that one was. Oh. I think that one was found and reported on the 16th of April and fixed on the 17th. Oh, okay. On the day of release. Right. Uh, there, there are others, though. Yeah. Uh, don't worry, I've got a few here. Yeah. Uh, there was also one where um, one of the um, scopes, the Reddit scope that allows you to search from the dash off to a number of places, and one of the sources was um, was Reddit. And there was a lot of, again, a lot of hang ringing and finger pointing and, uh, oh my God, Danger Will Robinson and all that kind of stuff um, because it was leaking data that you typed into the dash. When you say leaking data, what does that actually mean? Well, yeah. So, 
when you when you do a search in the dash, yes. it sends that to the canonical scope server, and then the scope server figures out which are the best places to send that to. So if you type in kiss, it might send it to like a uh, music, music search and uh, you know, other, other books or, or whatever. But um, it may also send it to Reddit to search for threads on Reddit that might be interesting or okay. subreddits that might be interesting. And um, it turns out that the piece of text gets sent to Reddit, but it gets sent in such a way that it actually appears in the logs for that Reddit. So if if an admin on that on Reddit on this third party site yeah. is looking through the logs, they can see these pieces of text that have come from the canonical server. Right. How would the canonical have... pass them on without passing them on? Well, uh, th- I think there was a problem in that it wasn't using SSL. So oh. there was the possibility that someone could do a man in the middle attack, not between you and Canonical, but between Canonical and Reddit, yeah, and see the traffic. But isn't it anonymized at that point anyway? Well, y- yeah, <laughs> uh, unless you type my name is Alan and I am searching Reddit for yeah. <laughs> <laughs> donkeys, then, yeah, or whatever picture I want, yeah. um, then <laughs> you know, counts. yeah, it is. And yeah, there was a lot of there was a lot of finger pointing, and it all kind of got a little bit heated is and a bit, now? a bit out, yeah. Uh, I believe so. Fixes in the works, but then another one came up. So there's a whole bunch of these like celebrity bugs that it seems that that the the, uh, the community and people outside the community are kind of jumping on them in the same way that they have over a period of time. But they there seems to be a lot of focus on it this week, mm. just after fourteen oh four has come out. Maybe they should have tried using it beforehand to give it some well, better tests. Well, some some have argued that you know yeah you should have, but some have argued that Canonical should have QA'd it better. That you know, letting a bug slip in on the day before release, where you can press enter and unlock the the screen, <laughs> is uh, is a bit problematic. Another one turned up after release, which uh, on I think on the lock screen, if you repeatedly smack the right mouse button in the toolbar in the top right hand corner, like the battery gauge yeah. and all that, you can make the lock screen break as well. Wow! So yeah, there's a few of these kind of you need uh, more Daves. Yeah. What? I don't know. <laughs> But, <laughs> I don't think that's the, oh I see oh Dave Morley yeah because yeah, that's the kind Dave, of crazy yeah. thing he does but there's only so much time he's going to have so yeah, other absolutely. people need to do that too yeah. so yeah there's been a few of those it's the first time anybody's ever said we need more Dave Morley I think uh, no I think it quite a lot yeah yeah yeah, yeah. oh Dave's good he is he wears hats he does Mark, cool. What's up next? Um, System D has landed in Ubuntu. Woo-hoo! Time to get rid of Upstart. Get rid of that rubbish. Yeah, yeah. 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 Are you with me? Who invented that rubbish? Yeah. Uh, oh. And yeah, the process has begun of uh, identifying which packages rely on Upstart scripts and porting stuff. All of them to. Uh, to well, no, a lot of stuff is actually System still services. is using sysv init scripts, which then just have a upstart sort of wrappy bit so there's the stuff that never actually got ported to upstart which yeah. now needs porting to system d mm-hmm. yes. and then there's stuff that did get ported to upstart that now needs porting to system d mm-hmm. yes. and then there's any new stuff that is written needs that's to be already, integrated with system that's already d. Yeah, a lot of stuff a lot of stuff already runs on systems which use system d so, so that what, stuff just needs including an ubuntu so via what? the power of community <laughs> uh, some of this has already been done in debian they've already started you know they oh, of course, the, yeah. the, the oh, thing yeah. that triggered this was the Debian that triggered the Ubuntu switching to Debian was that you know d- uh, to system, system D was that Debian was switching to system D. I was going to say you know uh, something we don't. Yeah, no, I don't. And and so you know we're starting that process as well. One of them, as soon as fourteen oh four came out, we opened up the archive for fourteen ten, the unculus whatever it is, yep. and um, soon after that we start synchronizing packages in from Debian, and some of those have already got. You know, all the system D stuff already done. So, so what's so. system D give us that Upstart didn't? What's wrong oh, with no, Upstart? Let's not get here. Then. <laughs> Scott did a lot of work on that. Yeah, he did. And uh, then he left. yeah, but then you know, Debian have decided to move to system D, and so we will move with them. Yeah, that's that's, that's going to happen. Enough, the, but... Well, the alternative presumably is that um, Canonical slash Ubuntu would have to have maintained separate packages for all of the things that Debian yeah. had moved to system D. I don't think they're necessarily separate packages, but we definitely need to make sure we've patches like them. keep keep upstart working because mm, yeah. you know, it already works for all our packages. We just have to keep it working and then any new stuff that arrives that's only system D and sysv in it, we'd have to make sure that works. So upstart was created by Scott when he was at Canonical. Yeah, years ago. So who creates system D? Uh Leonard Pottering and K Sievers, I think. For what organization? Uh, well, I think it was before they started at Red Hat, uh, okay. but they both work at Red Hat now. 
Right. Um, yeah. So apparently, the, so the story goes, Scott created uh, Upstart, and at some point, Leonard was going to help with Upstart, and there were discussions where um, Scott was giving Leonard things that he could work on on Upstart, and instead, Scott, uh, Leonard went away and created <laughs> System D. Mm-hmm. And once the the whole decision making process about Debian switching started coming about that's the point at which it came out that Leonard and Kay said hey if it wasn't for the canonical CLA we wouldn't we wouldn't have created system D or that's that's a trigger that made it happen because if they were going to contribute to upstart they would have had to sign the canonical CLA CLA the um, contributor license contributor agreement, agreement. We you sign copyright over, basically. Well, no, you so don't. You, you, you don't. You, yeah, you just assign the rights for them to redistribute, it, yeah, redistribute it as they wish. Yeah. Right. So, so they were saying, you know, what, this is back a few months yeah. ago. Um, but we've all got past that now. It's fine. It's so fine. What was Debian doing before? <laughs> they just had SysV in it. Yeah. Uh, so who else yeah. uses System D now? Everyone. Uh, everyone. Except Chrome OS and us. And, and every derivative of Ubuntu. It's Ubuntu? Uh, yeah, all of the L- flavors. Ubuntu. All of the flavors use Upstart. You can carry on listing them, but I now I've said to. all of them. You don't yeah, need you to. My <laughs> Everybody <laughs> is dead, Dave. <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> nice reference. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Excellent, Laura. What's up next? Um, whew, uh, there's a new Ubuntu support channel. No, oh, not another one. Oh, good. Um, and it's been launched for people who like Reddit. Specifically, those people. So, when you say support, where you can actually get technical help for problems, yes. yeah, yes, yes. Oh. But the, the announcement basically says it, it's a it's a post on the Ubuntu subreddit that says some people don't like Ask Ubuntu, so I'm making a subreddit which is basically Ask Ubuntu. So, yeah, I was going to say because when you ask a question on Reddit, people can vote you up and down, <laughs> yeah, and so, comment <laughs> and that. And sort I understand of it's a very a very popular question and answer sort of thing that are voting up and down. So, yeah. So just to take it back, what's Reddit? Oh, oh bless. Oh. It's the front page of the internet, <laughs> Tony. It's sort of like a forum, but not a forum. I'm not sure I'm cut out for this podcast anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you just so keep so twiddling your knobs. So long as you've got your gaming news, we're all right. Okay, yeah. You're still relevant, Tony. I <laughs> still have, have a job to do. <laughs> so basically, Reddit is has a bunch of uh, sub forums, which are called subreddits. But they're not forums. No, they're like forums in that you post and there are Alan threads. Alan approves of them on like uh, forums. The, yeah, exactly. Alan approves um, Well, the reason I prefer them over forums is because forums don't generally have the rating system that yes. allows me to go into one thread and see all the in- interesting stuff and not have to see all the garbage, yeah. which mm, right. forums do have. And Reddit is brilliant for that. But it has lots of special interest subreddits of any kind of interest they there will probably kill an even, entire day if on it you could they're probably even subreddits about wedding photography really or and doctor probably. who Let's <gasps> do it <inside laughs> yeah, there, there is one about doctor who there will be many about there's, doctor yeah, who there's, I loads imagine. Of, there's loads of threads on there anyway so there's this one that's about ubuntu and people post news articles and then discuss it or they post um, announcements and they might not get discussion but sometimes people post um support questions and what they're trying to do is push people towards a dedicated support area. Cool. Well, yeah. it's always good to have um, additional support channels as long as they can be supported and helpful answers given. I suppose that's yeah. the risk, isn't it? Diluting the efforts across a number of different channels. I don't think it is diluting. No, it's I about choice. Think... Well, it's not, no, it's not about choice. It's, <laughs> it's, about, putting, it's about putting support where, where people the people yeah. who need support are. Yeah. And where those people who might offer support are. Yeah. 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 Which is probably a good thing, actually. Yeah, you need both, really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like a giant echo chamber of, oh, I need support too. Do you need support? Yes, I do. Let's One, all sit yeah, together. There was, you know, a web, a web place where you can do that, like some sort of site on the web where you can go to is a good way of doing that. Yes. Someone set him off. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Is that all of the community news? I, I think it might think be. It is. I think we need a break. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> And that's all for episode five. We'll be back next week with an interview with Michael Meeks and Bjorn Michelson. Michelson. Very well done. About <laughs> the Open Document Foundation and LibreOffice. And we'll also have all your feedback. Cool. Yeah, and a command line love as well, I think. Oh, and a command That'd be line nice. Love. You can never awesome. get away without a command line love. Mm. Lovely. Oh, thanks for listening. 
We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.